Peace be with you. Welcome back, brothers and sisters. Welcome to Jesus via Mary. The best, surest, and the quickest way to the sacred heart of Jesus is through his mother, the Blessed Virgin, the Immaculate Conception. She's our mother, too. Mary, our mother. Let's begin with a prayer. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that any one who fled to your protection, implored your help, or sought your intercession was left unaided. Inspired with this confidence, we fly unto you, O Virgin of Virgins, our Mother. To you do we come, before you we stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, Despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. Today, brothers and sisters, I'd like to begin by talking to you a little bit about Mary, the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. Mary was a young girl, probably only about 12 or 13 years old, when the angel Gabriel came to her and asked her to become the mother of the Son of God. She had recently become engaged to a carpenter named Joseph. Suddenly, her life would be changed forever. Mary was at first fearful and troubled in the presence of the angel. She could never have expected to hear the most incredible news, that she would have a child and her son would be the Messiah. Although she couldn't comprehend how she would conceive the Savior, because she had earlier made a pledge of her virginity to God, still she responded to God with belief and obedience. Although Mary's life held great honor, her calling would demand great suffering as well. Just as there is always pain in motherhood, there would be much pain in the privilege of being the mother of the Messiah. Mary was the mother of the Messiah, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. She was a willing servant. She trusted God, and she obeyed his call. The angel told Mary that she was highly favored by God. This phrase simply meant that she had been given much grace, or unmerited favor is another way to say it. That had been given to her from God. Even with God's favor, Mary would still suffer much. Though she would one day be highly honored as the mother of the Savior, God knew that Mary was a woman of rare strength and obedience. She was the only human being to be with Jesus throughout his entire life, from his birth until his death. She gave birth to him as her baby and watched him die as her Savior. Mary also knew the scriptures. When the angel appeared and told her the baby would be God's son, Mary replied, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to thy word. She knew the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. Mary was young, poor, and female. These qualities made her unsuitable in the eyes of her people to be used mightily by God. However, God looked upon the quality of her trust and obedience. He knew she would willingly serve God in one of the most important callings ever given to a human being. Just like Mary, God looks at our obedience and trust, usually not the qualifications that man might look upon. God will often choose and use the most unlikely choices. Mary must have known that her submission to God's plan would cost her. If nothing else, she knew she would be disgraced as an unwed mother. She must have thought that Joseph would divorce her, or worse yet, he might even have her put to death by stoning. Mary may not have considered the full extent of her future suffering. How could she? She may not have imagined the pain of watching her beloved child 
bear the weight of sin and die a terrible death on the cross. Still, she willingly submitted to God's plan. Can we willingly accept God's plan? Can we even rejoice in God's plan like Mary did, when we know that it will cost us dearly? Yes, Mary accepted God's plan, and she even rejoiced in them. And this is evident by her prayer, the Magnificat, which she said when she visited her cousin and cousin Elizabeth. Her cousin had said to her, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. When I heard your voice, the baby inside of me jumped for joy. This is a case of Mary bringing Jesus to the baby who would become John the Baptist so that Jesus could sanctify him in the womb of his mother. John the Baptist therefore was born without original sin but not conceived without it. Only Mary has that honor of having been conceived without original sin. Now back to the Magnificat which Mary said at that time. We learn a lot about Mary from the prayer that she says. Mary's prayer is not a sad prayer or a weak prayer, it's a joyful prayer, a prayer of trust and confidence that God will continue to be close to those who seek to do His will. Mary proclaims her prayer boldly, for she knows God more intimately than any other human being in history. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Some people just radiate God's love. Their joy exceeds the bounds of this world. Mary was one of those people. In fact, she was one of those people personified. She did not have to be preachy because you sensed the presence of God just from meeting her. Lord, make my life more of a sign to the world of your love for all people. When I speak my words, serve to build up the body of Christ. For he has looked upon his servant in her lowliness, and all ages to come shall call me blessed. Why is Mary called blessed? Is it simply because she is the mother of the Savior? No. For when a woman from the crowd shouted, Blessed is the womb that bore you, Jesus said in reply, Blessed are they who hear my word and keep it. Mary received the word at Gabriel's invitation and kept it, no matter how hard life became. Help me, Lord, to be as open and receptive to your word as Mary was. Help me to be faithful to your world in good times and in bad. God, who is mighty, has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. What had Mary done to merit the honor God was bestowing upon her? Mary shows us what real humility is about. It's not saying to yourself, how worthless I am. It's saying to yourself how great I am because of God's grace. A priest once told me that humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's simply thinking of yourself less. Lord, keep me from becoming so proud of myself that I forget the source of my accomplishments. But never let me get so down on myself that I think I'm not capable of doing good for you. He has shown the might of his arm, and he has confused the proud in their inmost thoughts. He has deposed the mighty from their thrones, and raised the lowly to high places. The hungry he has given every good thing, while the rich he has sent empty away. That's the way God is. Mary knows that from experience. He takes a special interest in those who are without the basic necessities of life, who have no voice in the way things are decided, who don't count for much in the eyes of the world. Lord, 
Let my devotion to Mary always remind me of your concern for the poor and the lowly. Show me what I can do to help those in need. He has upheld Israel, his servant, ever mindful of his mercy, even as he promised our fathers, promised Abraham and his descendants forever. Mary knew that God fulfills his promises, but sometimes it's hard to wait. Sometimes I get anxious because things aren't happening as fast as I think they should. Lord, help me to live a life of waiting on you, as Mary did. Share with me some of Mary's patience and hope. And when my life is over, let me enjoy the fullness of your love in heaven forever. Mary was a woman of courage, and yet she had many sorrows in her life. There's an old saying, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. That's not a bad definition of the word courage. In spiritual terms, courage is simply grace under pressure. There are time and times in everyone's life that demand spiritual courage. Maybe it's illness or a problem child or a troubled relationship or failure or whatever. That's why Christians honor Mary for the courage she showed in all the painful circumstances of her life. People honor her as Our Lady of Sorrows. I prefer to call her Woman of Courage. Really, if anyone had a right to have things go her way, it was Mary of Nazareth. After all, she's the one who said yes to being the Mother of God. If anyone deserved God's special favor, it was Mary. But that's not the way it happened. Into Mary's life came sadness, sorrow, and pain, heart-rending pain at that. Through the centuries, Christians have found inspiration in the seven sorrows of Mary. They call us to spiritual courage. One of the sorrows in Mary's life was Simeon's prophecy. When Mary and Joseph presented their newborn infant to the priest in the temple, Simeon said to Mary, A sword of sorrow will pierce your soul. No dispensation from pain and sorrow for Mary. None for me either. Mary's heartache gives new meaning to my own. The Flight into Egypt Hardly had Jesus been born when the Holy Family became refugees, fleeing the wrath of King Herod. Mary and Joseph experienced all the pain and separation from relatives and friends. The loss in the temple, when Mary lost Jesus for three days. There was the time when the boy Jesus got separated from his parents and spent three days in the temple. Mary felt all the worry and anxiety that a mother could feel. For her child. The carrying of the cross when Mary met Jesus along the Via Crucis. Imagine the pain and anguish when mother and son met on the way to Calvary. Mary's courage brought her there, and courage carried her through it. The crucifixion. If there was any faith left in a human heart at that terrible moment of our Lord's death, it was in the heart of Mary, standing strong at the foot of the cross. As the body of Jesus was taken down from the cross, Mary did not collapse in tears or run from the scene. She stayed there because that's where she belonged. The Burial of Jesus In burying her son, Mary buried something of herself. Life had to go on but it would never be the same again. Now here's a daily prayer to Mary's courage. It's not enough to think about Mary's courage just once in a while. Draw close to this woman of courage every day. Do it by reciting a special prayer known among the Marianists as the three o'clock prayer, but you can say it at any time. In drawing closer to the crucified Lord, you will also draw closer to our Blessed Mother. She'll help you face the pains and sorrows of your own life with the same courage that she showed. 
This is the three o'clock prayer. Lord Jesus, we gather in spirit at the foot of the cross with your mother and the disciple whom you loved. We ask your pardon for our sins, which are the cause of your death. We thank you for remembering us in that hour of salvation and for giving us Mary as our mother. Holy Virgin, take us under your protection and open us to the action of the Holy Spirit. St. John, obtain for us the grace of taking Mary into our life as you did and of assisting her in her mission. May the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit be glorified in all places through the Immaculate Virgin Mary. Amen. We've been talking quite a bit, brothers and sisters, about suffering and sorrow, the suffering of Jesus and the sorrow of Jesus, and the sorrow and suffering of his mother, Mary. Why did it have to be that way? Why did Jesus have to suffer? Why did Mary have to sorrow so much? Because God willed it. Since here we are in Lent, I'm going to share you now some meditations on the agony in the garden and the other sorrowful mysteries of the rosary. These are given in Mary's own words and they are her thoughts, her recollections of what took place at that time. Again, now we begin with the agony in the garden. While on earth I was not present during my divine son's agony in the garden, and I did not see his great anguish at the thought of his approaching death. As his mother, however, I felt with my soul a pressing sadness which consumed my entire being. I knew he thought of the injustices to befall him often during the last months of his life. Now in heaven I possess all knowledge and can relate to you the events as they took place. My son, aware of the violent death he was to suffer for all mankind, took his eleven apostles into a nearby garden, the purpose being to pray. Now Judas was not present as he was already about his dirty work. The apostles were very weary and fell asleep. But my beloved son noticed nothing of his surroundings once he became enveloped in prayer. He saw with his divine knowledge all that he would suffer. He saw each blow of the scourging. He felt the weight of the cross beam on his shoulders. He knew each muscle and nerve that would be severed by the nails. He saw the sinfulness of mankind not only at that time but in the future as well. He saw the atrocities of war and terrorism, the degradation of the human body, the hate man would hold in his heart for his brethren. At last he saw the many lukewarm souls who were acquainted with him at some point in their lives but chose and continue to choose the world over him. At this point he addressed the Father and asked for the cup of suffering to pass him by. But finally, with a deep resignation to the will of the Father, he said, Not my will, but yours be done. I tell you, none of earth have or will suffer mental anguish as did my son, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And now the scourging of Jesus at the pillar. I witnessed this myself. My beloved son was led by the soldiers to the courtyard. Their treatment of him was particularly rough. They chained his wrists high on a pillar so that his flesh was pulled taut, thereby making it more easily lacerated. He was stripped of his garments. The whips that were used were not ordinary whips. They were so designed to tear and gouge at the victim's flesh. A soldier stood on each side of Jesus and took turns assailing him, tearing his sacred flesh. In all, he sustained over 5,000 wounds. When all was done, he was left standing in a pool of blood. For modesty's sake, 
he again covered himself and was led away, leaving blood, bloodied footprints. By this time his head throbbed from dehydration. How I longed to comfort him. I was so grief-stricken at the sight of him. The soldiers, knowing well their craft, had stopped just short of rendering him unconscious. So now, in his divinity, he knew well each pain that still awaited him. I would ask that you console him in prayer and penance. Thank you. This meditation is on the crowning of Jesus with thorns. The soldiers were not content with the brutal scourging they inflicted on my beloved son. Now they draped his body with a garment as for a king, all done with a gesture of mockery. They knew not that they had before them the king of kings. They fashioned a crown for him of thorns which grew close by. Those thorns were much longer than what you may imagine. They placed this crown upon his sacred head and proceeded to bow before him, mocking his royalty. They struck the crown of thorns with long sticks, thereby, thereby forcing these instruments of torture into his sacred head. This caused the precious blood to flow down his face, into his eyes, and in so doing blocked his vision. But he loved them so. Yes, he loved deeply even these who tormented him. With great humility he bore all. He could have, with one sigh, beckoned all the legions of angels to his aid. But he chose to suffer in humility for all mankind. And this is about Jesus carrying his cross. My beloved son, his flesh torn and pulled from the bones, was now given, in his weakened state, the crossbeam of the cross to bear upon his shoulders. His whole being trembled with weakness. His vision was now blurred from the ceaseless flow of blood rendered by the crown of thorns. He later told me that he continually saw passing before him, as he bore the weight of the cross, the millions of lukewarm souls that his sacrifice would mean so little to. But he was prodded on both by the soldiers and by his eternal love for all humanity. There were the agonizing falls until another was pressed to assist him. When I met him I could barely look at him in the eye, not wanting him to see my great distress, though he felt it, I'm sure. His look was one of resignation, and at the same time, compassion for me. He fell many times on this road of atonement for sinners, each fall rendering him more and more debilitated. Finally he reached his destination. There he sat himself down and with great anguish offered a prayer to the Father. In all that he suffered he showed great patience. And now the crucifixion. They put a type of harness about my son, that he might be led like an animal. This girdle aggravated the wounds he sustained during the scourging. The great cross beam was given to him to bear upon his torn shoulders, and with much disgust and contempt he was led to Golgotha. Once there he was unleashed and allowed to sit upon a rock while the cross was prepared for him. Now he was wringing his hands and looking towards heaven, as though desperate for assistance. At one point he was laid upon the cross, still on the ground, so as to fit it to his sacred body. The holes for the nails were then bored into the wood. This accomplished, they called him back to lay upon the cross and have his sacred flesh pierced by the nails. Now he felt the blows of the mallets before they were even struck and long after. Some adjustment was made with his two limbs, which did not reach the prepared nail holes. He also suffered as though upon the rack, as his arm and leg were dislocated from their sockets. Now the cross was erected. It was not very tall, I being able to reach his feet, 
but I could not bring myself to lay a finger on his tortured flesh. As he hung in agony, the unknowing soldiers cast lots for his poor piece of clothing. They were so detached and unaware of their deed. Now the sky darkened. Many onlookers began to take their leave. My son spoke little, but each word carried great weight. He addressed St. John and me. I knew as he spoke to me that it was not just John he gave me to mother, but all of mankind. This I accepted gladly. Towards the last half hour of his life he was little able to move, to breathe, and his speech was quite hoarse, though still clear enough to understand. As he took on the sins of mankind, he felt abandoned by the Father. At last he gave up his spirit. Now the earth began to tremble and heave, as though sighing over its loss. Still I waited, as a foreigner came to claim his body for burial. As his limp form was loosened from the cross and lowered into my arms, I wept in sorrow. I could not hold him as long as I wished, because of the lateness of the hour. They took him from me. Dear loving hearts of Jesus and Mary, let the flames of your hearts consume my self-will. Accept, loving Savior and most blessed Mother, my every thought, word, and deed, in reparation for all my sins and the sins of the entire world. Dear Jesus, let your generous mercy flow unceasingly into every soul. Help me, dear Mother, to find the way to the peace of your heart, refuge of sinners. I beg you, accept my sacrifices and prayers, no matter how humble. Bring faith and peace to all. Amen. Dear Jesus, through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, remove from me all selfishness in thought, word, and deed. Place in my heart, dear Jesus, a deep and abiding love for all that is holy, for the Blessed Trinity, for the Church upon earth, and for all people. Help me to show this love to all whom I come in contact with today. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. Spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all humanity, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. You may recall this prayer we mentioned to you the other day that was given by our Lord Jesus. Please pray along with me in your mind and in your heart. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat to the same rhythm. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be in unison. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances melt in one another. And may our lips beg our Heavenly Father together to obtain mercy. Well, our time is about up, ladies and gentlemen. We hope you've enjoyed our program and that you'll come back again same time, same station next week, every Thursday at 2.15 to 2.45. Keep us in your prayer, if you will. We love you. And we want to be with you. We have a lot more to share with you, and we hope that you will come and take advantage of it. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray for us who have recourse to thee. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Spread the effect of grace, of the flame of love, over all humanity. See you next time. God bless.